Way early on, we discussed the Earth as a system of interdependent spheres. And it's the interaction between all those spheres that allows life to exist. In this, the Global Change Unit, I want to explore how the Anthropocene, or the era of the humans, has been affecting these systems. This video will begin with the atmosphere. In video 5, we looked at how the climate has changed naturally over time due to the small changes in the Earth's orbit or because of catastrophic events like asteroid impacts. Today's climate shift is as a result of the greenhouse gases released through human activity. Greenhouse gases absorb and emit energy in the infrared, which is heat. Let's look at this effect. The sun's light passes through the atmosphere more or less undisturbed. There are particles in the atmosphere called aerosols that can reflect light back, but we'll skip those for now. When the sunlight hits the Earth's surface, the light energy is absorbed and radiated back up as heat. This infrared radiation continues to travel up, at which two things can happen. The heat may escape the atmosphere, or the infrared radiation can be absorbed by a greenhouse gas, thus trapping the heat inside the atmosphere. The more greenhouse gases are present, the more heat is trapped. Greenhouse gas effect is actually what's responsible for keeping our planet habitable. Both Mars and Earth are in a habitable zone of our star, or the area where liquid water can exist. Mars, however, is much colder than Earth because its atmosphere is much thinner, so it cannot hold in as much heat. But too strong of a greenhouse gas effect is also problematic. Venus has a runaway greenhouse gas effect, and despite being farther away from the sun than Mercury, it's much hotter. What we're doing is upsetting the energy balance of the Earth. The additional greenhouse gases we're releasing is causing a lot of additional heat to be trapped, thus increasing global temperatures. The most impactful of these greenhouse gases are carbon dioxide, methane, water vapor, nitrous oxide, and chlorofluorocarbons, or CFCs. Now, water vapor, despite being a greenhouse gas, doesn't actually contribute much to climate change because it has a short residency in the atmosphere, so we're going to avoid that. Carbon dioxide is our reference frame for comparing the relative global warming potential of other gases, measured on the global warming potential scale, which is a measurement of how much energy the emission of one ton of a gas will absorb over a period of time relative to the emission of one ton of carbon dioxide. Methane has a global warming potential of 21, meaning one ton of methane would absorb 21 times as much energy as carbon dioxide. Nitrous oxide has a GWP of 310, and CFCs have a GWP of 4,750. This increase in the greenhouse gas effect has led to increasing global temperatures, which are a part of climate change. Now we'll discuss all the aspects of climate change, but I want to limit this video to just the atmospheric component, so bear with me. One of the effects of increasing temperature is shifts in global wind patterns. Winds generated by atmospheric circulation help transport heat through the Earth. The temperature increase is observed to cause changes in these circulation patterns. The Hadley cell is expanding. The effect of this is that mid-latitude regions, like southwest United States, will become part of the downdraft system, creating much drier conditions. In fact, the southern Hadley cell is already causing drier conditions in South Africa as a result. The jet stream refers to fast-moving air currents in the polar regions. This jet stream is kept mostly stable because of a big temperature difference between the Arctic and mid-latitude air masses. Now, as the Arctic gets warmer, and the Arctic temperature is increasing faster than mid-latitude temperatures, this temperature difference becomes smaller. As a result, the jet stream weakens, and much like a spinning top when it begins to slow down, topples over. This allows Arctic air to enter parts of North America and Europe. So yes, 
during a polar vortex event, it's colder because of global warming. And now let's spitfire some other effects of increasing air temperatures. The number of extreme cold events has increased, mostly as a result of this jet stream change. The number of extreme heat events has increased. The number of drought events has significantly increased, becoming more frequent and more severe. The number of extreme rain events has also increased, meaning there is more water falling in the same time period on Earth. But I want to go back to these gases. Now let's take a closer look at CFCs. Now, CFC is the collective name for compounds containing carbon, fluorine, and chlorine. These chemicals are highly stable and non-combustible, so they were used a lot in applications as cleaning agents for electronics, coolants for air conditioners and refrigerators, and foaming agents for insulation. However, CFCs can reach the stratosphere and are the leading cause of ozone depletion. In the stratosphere, a UV ray from the sun will hit the CFC molecule. That causes a chlorine atom to break off. Now this chlorine atom reacts with ozone, removing an oxygen, thus depleting ozone. This creates chlorine monoxide and an oxygen molecule. But here's where things get worse. Chlorine monoxide reacts with any free radical oxygen atom in the stratosphere, causing the chlorine atom to break off. This chlorine atom is now free to break apart more ozone. This chain reaction that resulted in high rates of ozone depletion, resulting in a large ozone hole over the Antarctic Pole, which extended into parts of Australia, South Africa, and South America. A lowering of ozone concentration has many effects from the resulting increased UV radiation hitting Earth. Increased rates of skin cancer for humans, but it also resulted in skin damage to marine organisms, uh, damage to the DNA of plant species, I mean, especially to crops, and it even resulted in damage to nitrogen-fixing bacteria, which is really sensitive to UV radiation. All of this resulted in the Montreal Protocol in 1987, which was an international treaty that banned the production of CFCs and a few other ozone-depleting chemicals. Since then, the ozone layer has been slowly recovering, and in 2019, it was reported that the hole is the smallest it's ever been on record, but it still has not fully recovered. After the ban of CFCs, they were replaced with another group of chemicals that serve much the same purpose as coolants and air conditioning, called HFCs, hydrofluorocarbons, which contain hydrogen instead of chlorine. Though HFCs do not deplete ozone, they're also a powerful greenhouse gas with a GWP of around 1,000, depending on the exact chemical formula. Because the residency time for all these gases in the atmosphere is quite high, even if we stop emitting all of them today, the effects would still linger for a long time. This is why the urgency to enact solutions to climate change is so high. The effects of our actions will be felt for many years to come.